All right, would you please stand as I read our text for this morning? We stand to demonstrate publicly and visibly that these words are utterly unique. They are holy. These are God's words. I'll be reading Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, this morning, we are taking, uh, we get a short break from the the, uh, conflict and persecution narratives in the book of Acts, and instead, we are focusing on the issue of faith. And it's not hard to understand why Luke would include this particular story. You have to consider what has happened in a very short amount of time. The church has gone from 120 people in Jerusalem, all of whom are basically coming from the same cultural background that is a Jewish background. And that gospel has now spread to thousands of people. Thousands upon thousands of people have come to faith in Christ in the region of Jerusalem. But we saw with the stoning of Stephen that something unique happened. And what's happening now is not people in Jerusalem coming to faith in Christ, but now people of Samaria are coming to faith in Christ. The Samaritans were considered by most Jewish people to be half-breeds. So these are an inferior people in the minds of many Jewish people, having been influenced by Babylonian culture. So not only is the church dealing with massive growth, but now we're dealing with massive growth in a very different cultural context. And so this sets sets the stage for the early church to learn some things, and we get to learn them along with them. And they are these three things. What faith in Christ requires, what faith in Christ looks like, and who faith in Christ is for, what faith in Christ requires, what faith in Christ looks like, and who faith in Christ is for. So we'll start first with what faith in Christ requires. Um, It's funny how each kind of episode introduces us to a new person. In chapter 6, we're introduced to Stephen. In this chapter, we're introduced to a man named Simon. And Simon is what? He's a magician, right? Simon is a magician. And you have to understand that in that day, right, the word magician meant something different than the word magician means to us. I happen to be a huge fan of magic, and more specifically, sleight of hand card magic. I love uh, Penn and Teller's show, Fool Us. Has anybody ever seen the show, Fool Us? Okay, I love that show. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of Shin Lim, who won AGT a couple years ago. He came through Seattle, and Brandon actually got me tickets, so I got to go see him live. And uh, some of you know, I was in Vegas a couple weeks ago, getting some time in the sun, and I happened to go to a magic uh, uh, shop, and I was suckered in to buying the book and the cards and the whole thing. I love 
sleight of hand card tricks specifically, okay? Now, we understand when we see a magic trick performed, we understand that regardless of what the performer or the magician may say, we know that what we're watching is an illusion. We know that there is a rational explanation to what we're watching. In fact, that's one of the things that is so fun about watching. It's not the belief that this is a supernatural power. It's the understanding that there is an explanation to this, and I want to find it out because it's right in front of me, but somehow I'm so, I just can't get it, right? And so there's this intrigue. I want to figure it out. We know there's a rational explanation to it. However, magic in more ancient times was not that way. The magic being referenced here and another time referenced in the Old Testament is a combination of things. It's part science, that is the understanding of how things work. It is part illusion in sleight of hand, if you will, and it is also part the manipulation of nature through demonic forces. Think about the story of the Exodus. When Moses and Aaron are sent to Pharaoh, there is a little showdown that happens the first time, and Pharaoh has his what? His magicians turn a staff of wood into a snake, right? Super impressive. Until Aaron, his staff becomes a snake and eats their snakes, right? So they're gotcha, right? Figure that one out. That's not about sleight of hand. There is something happening, the manipulation of nature. Now, What's clear in this text about Simon is that Simon is regarded in a particular way by the people of Samaria. Verses 9 through to, uh, sorry, verse 10 says, They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. Okay? So they're not saying this guy has mastered sleight of hand. They're not saying this guy is a master of illusions, but rather this man is great. He's the power of God that is called great. Now, again, the point is, what exactly did that actually mean for Simon? That's not as much the point as the way it, he was regarded by the people of Samaria. Simon was understood to be a unique individual. He was connected to God, to the God in some way, and even believed to be a manifestation of God's great power. That's how he was regarded by the people of Samaria. But something happened. Something happened. Verse 12, it says, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. So here is Simon influenced the community until Philip shows up and it says, but then they believed Philip. And I want to just identify something that I think is really, really important. If we are going to understand not just our own faith, but we understand the context, this cultural moment that we are in. The people of Samaria did not become a people of faith after they heard the gospel preached by Philip. They did not become a people of faith after they heard the gospel preached by Philip. It wasn't after they heard about the life of Christ, his death and his resurrection, his ascension, the forgiveness of sins that is in his name. The people of Samaria were always a people of faith, meaning their lives were always built upon what they believed. It is an inescapable reality. Before, you can put it this way, before they put their faith in Christ, their faith was in whom? Simon. Before their faith was in Christ, their faith was in Simon. We have to understand this. The world is not divided into people who have faith and people who do not have faith. The, pe the world is divided into people who put their faith in Christ as Lord and people who put their faith in something else. But at the end of the day, everybody is a person of faith Everybody is trusting what somebody says about the world, what somebody says about life. Everybody is putting their faith in someone or something. Every single individual is building their life without exception, building their life based on things that they believe to be true. So people have beliefs about morality. 
It's a morality that is accepted by faith. People have beliefs about the existence or the non-existence of God, but those are beliefs, those are faith. People have different ideas about justice, but every one of those definitions comes down to a matter of faith. Everybody, even the person who says, I am secular, 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 I want nothing to do with religion, that person is living their faith, their their life by faith. Everything is an expression of faith. We are all building our lives on an understanding of what it means to be human, an understanding of what the purpose of our existence is, an understanding of of where this whole story is going. All of that, friends, is faith. Everybody is doing that. Faith is an inescapable reality. This morning, you are a person of faith. Every decision you make comes down to your faith. The question is this, whom do you believe? What do you believe? Who has authority in your life? The people of Samaria regarded Simon as great. We all have someone we regard as great. When we talk about the way we view the world, we're always quoting somebody. Somebody is informing that worldview. Someone is informing the way that we live our life. Who is that person? What is that source? What are the leaders and their voices that are dominant for you as you define life, as you think about your life? Or think of it this way, what truth is dominating your life? You realize this morning, regardless of who you believe in, your 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 life is being dominated by somebody's definition of truth. It is an inescapable reality. We are all, every single one of us, people of faith. And what that means is that if you're going to put your faith in Christ, see, when you put your faith in Christ, you don't just start believing something. You have to stop believing something. Right? They had to stop believing that Simon was the power of the great God. They had to stop believing things that they had believed, and they had to start believing new things. When you become a Christian, you do not just add Jesus to your life. When you become a Christian, you repent and you turn away from all the things you used to believe. You have to stop believing something And only then can you start believing the gospel that Christ is Lord, crucified, raised on the third day for the forgiveness of your sins, King of kings, Lord of lords, with authority and dominion over all things. You have to stop believing one thing before you can start believing Christ. That's what faith in Christ requires. Second, what what does faith in Christ look like? What does it look like? Once we stop believing something and we start believing something else, what does that look like? Verse 13, even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So so this is a very, just pretend you don't know the rest of the story at this point, okay? Here's Simon. He's the magician. He's the sorcerer. And all of a sudden, Simon hears about Christ. Simon hears the good news of the gospel And Simon professes faith in Christ, and Luke tells us that he was also baptized. Now, this is the normative thing that happens throughout the book of Acts. The gospel is preached, people hear it, they believe, they're converted, and they are baptized. This is why in Acts 2, when Peter got up and he preached the gospel, Christ is Lord, you killed him, the Father raised him to life, there is forgiveness in his names, in his name, and everybody goes, well, what are we supposed to do about this? And Peter gives this straightforward answer. Verse 38 of Acts 2, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So here we have this pattern. People are turning from old things that they used to believe, and now they're turning to new things. By the way, that's what repentance is. They're turning to faith in Christ. They submit to him as Lord. 
And then they are receiving the sign of baptism, which formally marks the entrance into God's family, his covenant family. And so this is what Simon has done. He heard, he believed, he was baptized. And all goes well, right? Simon started well, and he didn't end well. In verses 18 through 20, it says, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone of whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Now here's the thing. Simon starts well. It doesn't go so well. What, what is happening? How bad does it go here? Like, what is, what is the weight of Peter's rebuke to Simon? R.C. Sproul gives us some insight onto what Peter is saying to Simon. He says, what Peter said was this, you and your money go to hell. He pronounced the worst judgment upon the sorcerer and consigned him with the request to the deepest regions of hell itself. What does R.C. really think? It's very, very clear. It's much like when the Apostle Paul says, if anyone professes another gospel, let him be eternally cursed. So what are we to make of the experience of Simon? He believed, right? He was baptized, right? What started well didn't end well. Jesus spoke of this very thing in what's often referred to as the parable of the sower. He said, here's how you need to think about the kingdom. He talks about a sower that goes, a farmer that's throwing seed. The seed is the good news. Christ is Lord. His death, his resurrection, his victory over sin and darkness. That's like a seed. And you know what? We throw that seed everywhere. That seed goes everywhere. But that seed doesn't always fall on the same type of soil. Jesus goes in to talk about four types of soil. One soil receives the seed the seed dies, comes back to life. That's what seeds do, and it sprouts a harvest. This is a soil that produces the fruitfulness that the seed is intended to produce. But then he talks about other soils. And some of those soils, they receive the seed, and the seed looks like, oh, it's growing, it's growing, and then it gets choked out. And sometimes the seed falls on rock, and it's just, it's very superficial. It's just sitting there, and a bird may came, come and pluck it away. But not all of the seed does the same thing. Sometimes the seed produces multiplying growth, and sometimes a seed produces immediate growth only to be scorched by the sun or choked out by weeds. This is what happens when the gospel is preached far and wide. Some people genuinely respond to the gospel in faith and repentance and baptism. And they maintain in that faith through the duration of their life. But other people believe. They profess. And they receive the sign. They're baptized. But for one reason or another, that seed ends up being choked out. Some of you, you've, you've witnessed this tragic. Someone who professes faith, someone who has been part of the church, someone who's been baptized. If, if someone asked you, are they a genuine believer? You would say, yeah, they're a genuine believer. And then one day you wake up and they've made a entire wreck of their life. They've deconstructed their faith and they're out. What happened? Wrong soil. Sometimes that's immediately apparent not much time has passed with Simon, who is professing and baptized, and then maybe it's a couple days later, and Peter's like, no. Other times it takes years. Sometimes it's an entire lifetime. Someone gets to the end, and they say, I never really believed. This helps us to understand what genuine faith, what saving faith looks like. When we think of faith, sometimes we, we, we look backwards. We go, there's a time where I didn't believe and then I believed. But we think of faith as simply this past experience, something that happened to us in the past. 
Certainly, faith is something that happens to us in the past. For many people, you can remember you weren't a believer, and then you were a believer. Now, some of you grew up in Christian homes, and you're like, I don't have that story. That's great. You don't have to have that story, right? But some people do have that story. They, they heard it, and there was a change, and there was a profession, and it was followed by baptism. That's great. But the question is not, did you believe back then? The question is, do you believe right now? Do you believe today? Are you still professing and confessing that Christ is Lord, that there is forgiveness of sins in his name? Are you still seeking to obey your, or to live your life in obedience to our Christ? Is that an ongoing reality? Because true faith in Christ, saving faith, is an abiding reality faith. It's not just a present or a past reality. It is also a present reality. That's what true faith looks like. It endures. Are there high points and low points? Yeah. Does it feel like there's more low points than high points? Yes. In the moment, does sometimes just feels like it's overwhelming darkness? God, where are you? What the heck is going on? Yes. But that faith, has an enduring element to it. It endures those things. So let me just ask you before we go to the next thing, how are you doing in this area? How is your faith growing? How are you growing in obedience to God? What areas are you struggling with? Meaning, you know God said, this is what I made you for, like, do this, don't th- do this, and you're like, mm, I don't like that, or that's difficult. How are you struggling with your faith? Can you think about how you've made progress over the last month or the last year in your faith? What are you learning? How are you growing? And consider this, what right now, this morning, right here, what is currently threatening to choke out your faith? What is the temptation? What is the false doctrine that is alluring you, that you are tempted to give into, to abandon obedience or to abandon the historical orthodox teaching of the church? What is currently threatening you? My friends, know that faith, genuine faith, saving faith is an enduring faith. Lastly, we'll consider who is faith in Christ for We are going to look at what I think is theologically the most interesting and potentially confusing part of this text, and you will see it in a moment if you didn't notice it when I read it earlier. Um, It can be difficult to wrap our minds around it, but we're going to try it together. You guys with me? Here we go. Verses 14 through 17. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. What is that about? What is going on here? So let me describe what what Luke is saying, and then we'll unpack it together. Philip had gone to Samaria as a result of the persecution, And with him, he brought the gospel, and he preached the gospel, and the people of Samaria came to faith. They professed faith in Christ. They had been baptized, right? And in spite of this, they had not received the Holy Spirit in some way. You should be scratching your head. This is weird. So they had not received the Holy Spirit. And then the apostles come down, Peter and John come down, and they lay their hands on them, and then they receive the Holy Spirit. And they receive the Spirit in a way that is discernible, not only to Peter and John, but Simon's there. He's like, hey, I want to do that trick. So what are we to make of this? There are clearly two stages in the salvation of these Samaritans. The first stage is faith in baptism, which came to them under Philip. And the second was the receiving of the Holy Spirit in some some discernible way that was visible or that was uh, discernible to the apostles as well as Simon. So these are these two particular 
stages. We do not know what exactly happened that Simon knew that the Spirit had fallen on them, nor do we know exactly what Peter and John had witnessed to know that the Spirit had fallen on them in this unique way. We may speculate and go, well, when the Spirit fell on the apostles in Acts chapter 2, what'd they do? They spoke in languages, real languages that they had not known previously. And so perhaps these Samaritans are doing the same thing. The reality is we do not know what it looked like, and Luke is not interested in telling us what it looked like. If he wanted to, he would have. What we do know, what is clear, is this took place in two distinct stages. So what do we make of it? Some have taken this story and they have built a theology that says salvation comes to all Christians in two distinct stages. And this is true for all Christian experiences. That means that those who believe that see this story as the normative pattern that is set forth from us in the New Testament. Uh, people who, who believe that would would fall on the charismatic and Pentecostal end of the spectrum and would argue that faith in Christ and baptism is one thing and then there's another thing that has to happen you have to experience, which usually means speaking in tongues. Now, I do not want to make a straw man argument, nor do I want to put words in people's mouths, so I will quote to you from the Assemblies of God website. This is their statement of faith, part seven and eight. You can go there later today and look at it if you would like. This is what it says. All believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and fire, according to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the normal experience for all in the early church. This experience is distinct from and subsequent to the experience of the new birth. Okay, so there's the two stages, faith repentance, baptism, and this other thing. They go on to say, the baptism of believers in the Holy Spirit is witnessed by the initial physical sign of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them utterance. Okay, so these are distinct subsequent experiences. And this is all taken from this particular text. Now, one of the obvious implications to this verse, or not to this verse, but to this statement, is that if you have believed in Christ and you have been baptized, yet you have not spoken in tongues, then what's wrong with you? Are you a genuine believer? Should you be concerned? Are you truly a Christian? Is there something deficient with your faith if that has not yet happened? If that is the normative pattern that is set forth and you have not experienced that normative pattern, then there's something to be very concerned about. So let me just clarify this. Here is the question in the text. There are clearly two stages to the experience of the Samaritans. There's no debate there. This clearly happened in two distinct experiences. The question is this. Is this experience to be understood as a normative pattern of experience? And if it's not to be understood that way, wait, why in the world does it happen at all? Right? So is this the normal pattern? And if not, why would it happen? John Stott is uh, very, I think, helpful in this. He says this, we do not deny that the Samaritan experience did in fact take place in two stages, nor have we any right to deny that having happened once, it could happen again, especially if the circumstances are similar. We must not infringe the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. But we press the question, is it God's normal purpose that the reception of the Spirit is a second experience subsequent to conversion and baptism? To this question, we need to give a negative answer because what happened in Samaria diverged from the plain and general teaching of the apostles. Initiation into Christ, according to the New Testament, is a single stage experience in which we repent, believe, are baptized, and receive both forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, after which, by the indwelling power of the Spirit, we grow into Christian maturity." So here's what he is saying, that there is clearly two stages in this text. However, we're not to understand that as being normal because what is normal throughout the rest of the New Testament is not a unique two-stage experience, but a single experience of hearing the gospel, confessing Christ, 
and being baptized and that not being followed by some unique demonstration. If you think back to the beginning of Acts chapter 2, you have two Unique, thing, unique things happening here. The apostles, the Spirit does fall on them, and they do speak in tongues, right? They do speak in real languages that they do not know previously how to speak. And Peter preaches the gospel, and thousands of people go, okay, we believe, what should we do? Peter's answer to them is to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Luke doesn't say anything about the Spirit coming on them in any discernible way that they could see it. They received Christ by faith, and they were baptized. Furthermore, nowhere in the New Testament does it indicate that faith and regeneration are even possible apart from the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it is uh, it is impossible for us to believe apart from the Spirit and the faith that God gives us, meaning that if you believe in Christ, then you have the Spirit. Because where the Spirit is, and only where the Spirit is, is their faith in Christ. Additionally, it is overwhelmingly clear that we are justified by faith alone. In Christ alone, not by faith in Christ, plus a unique experience of the Holy Spirit. So if that's true, and it is true, why in the world do we have this abnormal, unique experience that is causing us to discuss this on a Sunday morning? Why? And the answer, I think, is quite simple. It wasn't for Philip. Philip didn't need to learn anything. Philip's gospel preaching wasn't deficient. The, the apostles weren't coming up and, and making up for everything that Philip screwed up. It wasn't for Philip. It wasn't even for the sake of the Samaritan believers. Who is physically present for this moment with the Samaritans? Who is it? Peter and John. Peter and John. This unique moment, friends, is for the apostles. Now, why? Now, this is going to come up later in the book of Acts with the Jerusalem Council. And when we get there, we'll look back and go, see, told you. But for now, just know this. There is a massive paradigm shift that had to take place, particularly in the minds of the apostles. The Samaritans didn't necessarily have this issue, but the Jewish leadership did have this issue. And it was this, they understood, they tended to understand God's salvation in Jesus Christ was for the Jews and not for the Gentiles, right? This is for God's people, Israel, it's not for the Gentiles. And what needed to change is that they needed to understand that Christ had come and suffered and died to pay the, the, the wages of our sin. He had done that both for the Jew and for the Gentile, for the whole rest of the world. Understand, it was very normal as is the case specifically with the Samaritans, it was very normal for Jewish people to consider Samaritans half-breeds, right? They were part of the, the exile. They were taken into captivity. They had adapted to these cultural norms. Jewish people living in Jerusalem saw the people of Samaria as half-breeds, unworthy outsiders. But imagine what happens to Peter and John. Peter and John are Jewish guys, and they travel to Samaria, the place that you would travel around. You don't want to go through it. You go around it. They are in Samaria, and they witness with their own eyes these half-breeds receiving the same spirit that they received. They're seeing the Spirit of God come down on these Samaritans in a unique way in the same way they witnessed it in that room as they were waiting to preach at Pentecost. And here's the conclusion. If God gives his Spirit to the Jews, and if God has given his Spirit to the Samaritans, 
then we can no longer make an ethnic distinction between these groups. We can no longer say this group of people is superior and this group of people is inferior because God the Father gave his spirit to the Samaritans and so therefore they must be equal brothers and sisters. God was demonstrating to John and Peter in a powerful way that the kingdom of God is given to all who believe, any who believe, anyone. This, guys, this is a huge issue in the New Testament. So much of the conflict that is taking place is the question of how do Jews and Gentiles now live side by side as equals with one another? Note that the book of Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul to address this issue because there were Christian Jews and then there were those who were not cultural Jews that they had professed faith in Christ and they had been baptized, but they were not considered equal. And that's why the Apostle Paul calls Uh, Peter out to his face publicly and rebukes him, that is a biblical thing to do, and says that he's out of step with the gospel because these cultural distinctions no longer function in the body of Christ. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. Now, pause button. (laughs) <laughs> that scared you. Paul's not saying men can become women and women can be men because there's no male or female in the body of Christ. That is not at all what he is saying. Those, a, a man remains a man and a woman remains a woman and a Jew remains a Jew and a Greek remains a Greek. What he is saying is that when it comes to the issue of justification, to the forgiveness of sins and membership in God's covenant family, it does not matter. Jews receive Christ and are full members of the family. Non-Jews receive Christ and are full members of the family. Men receive Christ, they're full members of the family. Women receive Christ, they're full members of the family. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what socioeconomic status you occupy. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. In Christ, Jesus is the only thing that matters. This is what the early church had to figure out. They had to come to terms with it. And through the giving of the Spirit in a powerful way, delayed in Samaria, Peter and John had to go back to the the Jerusalem council and go, guys, we witness it ourselves. These people who you have thought are outsiders forever, they're not outsiders in the kingdom of God because the same spirit that fell on us, and you and I were there, we saw it, it also fell on them. They must be our brothers and our sisters. It is this truth that would propel the young church in Acts into its global mission. Good news for all people. And it's the same truth that ought to give us encouragement and conviction today. The gospel that is being proclaimed here, the gospel which we have received by faith, that gospel is available to all. And we better understand that the people who drive us crazy, the gospel's for them too. The gospel's for them too. It is extended to all who would come to faith. In Christ. And if the gospel and the kingdom are open to all who would come by faith, how can we not go to all? See, the reason that the the church can't stay in Jerusalem is because the gospel is for the whole world. And the reason that the church can't, uh, the gospel can't stay right here is because the gospel is for all of Kitsap. And if God is true, and it is, then how can we not? Go to all. Friends, the invitation to you this morning is to come to Christ. Regardless of who you are, where you've been, what you have done, Christ is all. 
He is Lord of lords. He is King of kings. He came. He was crucified in your place for your sins. He rose in victory on the third day. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling over all things. And he invites you to come to him for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's pray. Jesus, no one has the words of life. There is nowhere else, no one else to whom we can turn. Nobody else has stepped off their heavenly throne. No one has suffered and died for our sins. No one else has been raised on the third day. No one else loves us like you do. So Lord, help us to turn from all other hopes, from all other promises, for all, from all other faulty, empty gospels, and help us to trust in you alone with an enduring faith that abides, that sticks with us. And Lord, not only for ourselves, but we ask this for our community. We see need and we see darkness and we see captivity and slavery and bondage and we see deceptive lives and we are asking for you to set captives free that they too would come to a saving knowledge of you and Lord would you use us to do it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.